Okay, um, so let's go ahead and get started. I got a few people here live with their notebooks. Some people have their dev box up. Some people are showing me some issues here. Um, so if you have questions, whether on chat or here kind of live, let me know. I mean, I, I was basically planning on, um, we can review the, the first problem set maybe, look over that, um, and we can also look at the first program assignment. So see if people have questions about that, so. Um, there was a full, let me go ahead and get our class up here too. Um, All right, so um, yeah, so this week um, we're past the first problem set. Um, um, I don't know if anybody wants to kind of go over that or not. There was a posted solution. You should be able to see that, of course. Um, there was feedback for the first uh, written problem set um, as well. Um, I mean, it, it is good to you know make certain that you understand uh this because um this is what we're going to be implementing on the simulation here um i think the biggest i mean you know the the biggest um issues for most people were either not quite getting the negative number format negative number representation correct um and i mean some people are still a little bit iffy on some of the jumps although not too many so so i think the biggest thing was negative number format, which, you know, um, depending, uh, should have only been a few points that I took off. Um, so once again, uh, I mean, on that, on the first problem, we def the, the, our hypothetical machine defined a simple sign magnitude format. So real computing architecture systems don't uh, they use something a little bit more um, sophisticated. So you might have heard of one's complement or two's complement. So usually it's actually built into the hardware that it uses two's complement to represent signed integers. So the instructions for, you know, like add and subtract. Um, so there'll be separate instructions for floating point adds and subtracts at the machine level and for integer uh, adds and subtracts. Sometimes they're separate ones for um, sign, um, signed uh, mathematical operations and sometimes for, for unsigned, depends on the architecture. But anyway, so um, for a simple sign magnitude format, you know, the, the most significant bit just indicates negative or positive, right? So, you know, to get this one correct, or to, to get these representation of negative numbers correct, you had to be able to kind of convert from a binary number into uh, hexadecimal. So some people, some people were kind of inconsistent. So we're, so like for this first one, we're using a decimal notation instead of hexadecimal notation. But then would later on uh, get it correct and use hexadecimal. So. But just real quickly, you know, specifically when we have um, five. Um, and we subtract two, you know, you get a three result and it's gonna look the same whether you, whether you think of if this is a decimal or a hexadecimal number. But um, on fetch two, when we've got three in the accumulator, so, so our, our, our second instruction was an add instruction from 941. When we add seven plus three, the result is 10 decimal. Um, so you get an A, um, um, hexadecimal, so zero X, zero zero A. Um, for representation here. So some people had 10 there instead, you know, weren't consistently using hexadecimal for all these. Um, so for these jump instructions, um, you know, I said it kind of last time, um, but some people still didn't quite get them. The, um, the, the, 
uh, our textbook talks about different categories of machine instructions, right? So you've got your data manipulation instructions. So those are you, things like your arithmetic operations and your logical operations. So doing like ands and ors or doing adds and subtracts. So then you, there's kind of another category of instructions, um, your flow control instruction instructions, I think um, is, the category, is, is what the category is called by our textbook. Um, so those affect the, the flow of control of the program counter, right? So basically whenever you um, execute a jump instruction, um, whether it's an absolute jump or a conditional jump, uh, instead of make, modifying the, the, the accumulator or some register, uh, it's affecting the program counter. That's, that's what a flow control instruction does, right? So, um, so for a conditional jump, like, like jump if it's zero, um, you basically, the, the instruction is going to check if the accumulator is zero, which it is in this case, and if it is, you know, so, so the value doesn't get, doesn't change the accumulator, it changes the program counter. So in this case, for all of our jump or branch instructions, the address portion gets just pushed into the program counter if, um, if the, if the jump or the branch executes, right? So in this one for question two, problem two, um, it was zero, so the, the 300 should have been pushed in there. So the effect is we got a small loop. So we go back to um, the program counter location 300, uh, fetch the subtraction again. You know, so initially we had what? We had two um, in the register and we did a subtract in, in the accumulator. Uh, we did subtract, so, so two minus two gave us zero. And then when we do it again, we get two. Um, so for on the fetch execute three here for our, our second problem, you get zero minus two. Um, and the result again should have been a negative two here, right? So, um, the correct way to represent this, you know, so if you look at the bits here, um, um, I, I won't type it out, but but you know the 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 first four bits are one zero 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 for a negative number in this case, and then the rest of the bits are all zero except for the the last two bits represent a two magnitude for negative two. But you know again one zero 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 the first four you know each one of the hex digits um, uh, represents four bits. So, so that's the basic reason why we use hexadecimal notation because it's directly translatable between uh, binary and hexadecimal. So anyway, 1000 uh, binary is eight hexadecimal, right? So some people um, um, kind of represented that incorrectly as, um, as, as one instead of eight uh, hexadecimal, right? as if the binary was 0001. Um, so, th so that's why it should be eight here for the representation. Um, all right, and so on. So I don't know if, if um, we need to go into any more on these. So again, for the last one, you know, it's pretty similar to number two. So we start off with a, a zero, uh, and, and most people got the, the, um, the, well, the load correctly, loaded in zero FC, um, and got the subtract correct, but then some people didn't quite have the representation of negative. Um, FC here. So when you subtract uh, FC from zero, you get a negative FC, which will be eight zero FC in this representation in hexadecimal here. All right. So most people either had some minor problems. The, the biggest problems were just um, representing negative numbers here, maybe a little bit of problems with the jump, or uh, you know, a few students um, were having trouble. Um, translating these opcodes, you know, and, and, and had a lot more problems. So if, if you were in that category, you probably need to go back and reread, I mean, you know, look through the example solution, uh, reread about the hypothetical machine. So you might, might need to review you know, chapter one materials, All right? So, you know, some people, I mean, if you mistranslated one of these, you know, that's one, just, just one time, that's one thing. So, so you might have incorrectly did a load when you should have done a store. But um, um, if, if you weren't able to, to understand, you know, why a 4940, you know, the first digit being a four, um, that's a, um, 
um, a subtract instruction. So, so, so if you don't understand that mapping, you probably need to go back and review uh, our chapter uh, materials on the hypothetical machine here. So. All right. Um, anybody want to ask anything about that one before I move on? Um, All right, anyway, so I'll always post those so for people to self look at after the fact, um, and there is also should be feedback, you should be able to see specifically which ones um, I gave points for or took points off for um, of, of the four problems, but you'll get a similar feedback for each one of the written problem sets. Um, um, All right, so yeah, I mean, I was, I was gonna, I'm gonna try and keep it to maybe another 30 minutes here uh, and then have some more time for uh, people that wanna ask about dev box questions or keep working on that with people. Uh, but yeah, I thought I would talk about the first assignment, some, some more detail um, uh, of things. So let me go ahead and start up my own dev box. So just kind of as a reminder, uh, I usually keep my stuff in boxes. So if you follow the instructions for setting up your dev box, uh, you'll be in repos instead of boxes, but same idea. Um, and then you need to go into your directory. Um, OS dash sims. Um, always use the vagrant up and the vagrant halt from the command line to cleanly um, uh, boot up and shut down your um, uh, your, your class development boxes here. Uh, I mean, you can access these from the uh, VirtualBox GUI, but but um, um, uh, Vagrant is actually managing these. So um, things will be incorrect if you try to boot it up or shut it down from inside of the GUI. So, so you should always be using Vagrant to manage um, uh, these boxes here. Um, I know some people are still having some issues, so we're still trying to work on these. Um, um, you should let me know because I can give some alternatives. Although, you know, I'd hope most people, um, I think most people do have have a running dev box at this point, quite a few anyway. So you should have this up and are able to um, get into it. Um, so you can be looking at the assignments and things. Um, so for a normal boot up, when you do a vagrant up, if you don't get any error messages, you know, in particular, you should be looking that you've got your port 8080 being forwarded. Um, and this for this class, it is important that the folders are mounted correctly. So you should see a message. Um, it should check for the guest additions. Um, uh, you may or may not see a message about their okay, but you should definitely see that that you get your folders mounted from somewhere. Um, you know, to this should be this the, the one on the right should be the same as your home directory on your host machine. So, like for your Windows system, this will be something like C colon users your username repos, whatever. If you're a Mac system, it'll be what, slash, slash users, slash your username or something like that. Um, and if that's running, I mean, you know, another way to check, you should be able to go to the um, localhost IP address to your port 88 um, and, and access the VS code server from there. So you'll get, um, something that looks like this when, when you bring it out. So. Um, so last time, let me go ahead and open that folder and see if there's any questions from people. Um, I'd gotten you started on the first time. So if you're restarting and, and reopening, you can continue back on your previous work. You need to always open the correct folder to work on these things from Visual Studio Code. So, you know, you have to find open folder from the file explorer, or you can do like a file open folder. Um, and um, these are mounted the way that I've, I've described. You should find them in the sync assignment folder. What you want to all, you always want to open up the folder for the assignment. So you don't want to open up at, at, the, um, at the level you know, the parent of all the assignments, you need to open up a particular assignment to have the build system working correctly and to have the Visual Studio Code um, configuration set up and running. Um,
I mean, some, sometimes I don't know exactly what that message was, but um, for Visual Studio Code running in a browser like this, refreshing your tab is kind of like restarting Visual Studio Code IDE. So, you know, if you see, see some things, you can kind of restart the Visual Studio Code by just reloading your browser tab. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for so I've got um, I've got all my files down here and I've got my outline view up here I think I mentioned that last time so let's uh, I mean you know whenever I start up I always check to make certain that um, I can still build and run all the tests okay so you should always make certain to keep your your code in a compilable and runnable state so for example if we open up the um, test file um, um, your keyboard shortcut should be uh, bound to um, control shift one should uh, allow you to do a make clean. You can always do these from the command line uh, by hand if you have to. So um, so control shift one runs a make clean. That's, that's the same as opening up a terminal um, in like your assignment one and just running make clean by hand. So the, so the keyboard shortcut is just simply invoking these make the, the build system that we have for these assignments by hand. So if you want a list of all the targets, if you do like a make help, uh, you can see all the targets um, besides the ones that you can access directly from the keyboard shortcuts. So, um, oops. so anyway, so control shift one, just cleans up everything so you can make certain you have a, a clean build. Control Shift 2 should do a make all. Um, so it should rebuild everything. So I talked a little bit about this. And it's a good I did. It's good that you understand at least some of the basics of what's happening on these projects when it builds. So it's actually these projects, you know, are, are um, big enough that we've separated the code out into multiple files. So this is a multi file project um, and C++ uh, like most compiled languages, um, supports this model, this idea that we separately compile files. Um, so so we, we separately compile each source file into what's known as an object file, and then we link those together to create uh, an executable. So in this case, um, you know, we're compiling the assignment one test into an object file. That's the first thing that happens. Um, so, so that's a compilation. And then secondly, we compile the hypothetical machine simulator into an object file. Um, and there's another compilation of an object file. Um, or no, is it the, and then on the third line here, we're actually linking all these together. So, so it looks similar because we're using uh, G++, which is the GNU C++ compiler. Uh, but, but here, since uh, we specify object files, it actually invokes the linker. And the result is uh, a, a, an executable called test. So this is an actual thing that we can run. Right. And this is actually the unit test so that when you do the control shift three, uh, it's actually running these unit tests. Um, you can run these by hand and then also from the terminal. Um, by doing dot slash test. So that will actually run the, um, the executable test executable that was run, that was created there. So, um, Right. And then uh, what I want to point out, because I, I want to look at the sim file as well. So these the 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 project, the assignments actually build two executables um, as part of these assignments. And what we're ultimately building on these assignments, we're building simulations of different aspects of an operating system. So for this first assignment, we're building a hypothetical machine simulator, something that runs the um, hypothetical machine architecture that you did for the first problem set um, and, and the, the instructions in chapter one here. Right? So, um, you know, when you do a full build, you'll see that it builds um, this assignment one sim.cpp file into an object file, and then it links together that, that sim object file with the hypothetical machine object file. Um, 
and the exceptions uh, into an uh, executable called sim, all right? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that, but um, 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 I'll skip over. But, but just like you can run the test from the command line by hand, dot slash test, um, you know, so, so both the, the test and the sim executable are built and put into your assignment when you do a build like that. So you can also run the sim, which is the simulation that we're building um, for each one of our five units for this class here. So, so I'll get back to that. Um, So, I mean, last time um, I had started talking about assignment one, so we'll see if anybody has questions. So I'm not going to give more kind of code going forward, but we can continue on discussing uh, what you need to do for assignment one. I mean, you know, the, the basics is, I mean, you're mostly working with the, the test, right? So, so, I mean, you know, you can run the test by hand on, on the command line, like I showed, or if you do the make tests on the command line, um, it, it's actually running the, um, the same thing like I just showed. So it's actually invoking the, the unit test executable there. Um, oh, by the way, um, so this might cause problems because you really need to see, to be able to scroll back up and see the first test. And there's enough here that I, I suspect that I'm, I'm not able to scroll all the way back up to the beginning here because it's hitting the, 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 the buffer for um, saving the number of lines on the output. Um, so that, that should be a setting in Visual Studio Code. So you should be able to up that. Um, so I usually um, go over to the gear icon over here to get to my settings. And it's probably called like um, terminal um, line numbers or something like that. See if I can find the name here. or maybe buffer or something like that. Yes, okay, so scroll back, terminal scroll back. Or I guess terminal buffer works as well. So yeah, it looks like it has a limit of a thousand by default. So you might need to up that in order to actually use the test output. So I'll, I'll make it 10 times bigger, like 10,000 there. Let me, let me run the test again. So, you know, if I didn't show up before, so you can also just do control shift three to run the make test um, using a keyboard shortcut, but it, it does the same thing. So you should always go back up and look at the first failing test, right? So, so yeah, if, if your buffer isn't big enough, you might not be able to, you need to be able to scroll back to the top and see that it's running slash test as if we were doing it from the clan line, and then that is guaranteed to be the first failing test. So that's, that's really what you need to, to see. So, so most of these assignments take the form of, you know, you should add a little bit of code, so work incrementally. So I have like one line of code, rebuild, run the tests, and see if you're passing um, the, the test you were trying to work on or not, right? And, and you should always try and concentrate on the first failing one. Um, uh, and see what's wrong with that. So in this case, last time I pretty much we implemented most all of initialized memory. So, you know, we're, we're passing the, the tests here. The first failing one, you know, if it's not obvious, um, there's no, as far as I've been able to find, there's no like real good integration of, of the C++ testing framework so that you could like click on this to go to the, to the line of code. So you do have to kind of, parse this a little bit, find the line number, um, and, and, and then um, go to the corresponding line in the file for that test. So in this case, the line, the, the first test that's failing is on line 66 here in the assignment one test, not PPP. Right? So that means that all the tests above that are actually passing and we're getting down to um, this test of translate address here before we're failing. So, right? Uh, 
Um, Okay, let's um, let's go back. Let's look at the assignment description. So I mentioned this last time. I mean, there's multiple ways that you can look at the assignment description. Um, oh, by the way, I'm going to be returning back the feedback for the assignments in the form of a markdown file. So um, split that. Go back. So um, there's both a markdown file and a PDF file here. I mean, you you can just open up the markdown file. Um, this is um, um, a type of markup language like, like hypertext markup language, uh, but it's become pretty popular for um, coding projects. So GitHub by default uses markdown for the readmes and, and for basic documentation projects and things like that. So, I mean, you know, this is readable, but it is plain text. Um, you can format markdown, um, like you can right click on here and open a preview. So you'll get, you know, your level one headers rendered and your bullet points and tables and things, get a little bit of readability. Um, so I mentioned that. So one way, when I give you back the, the feedback for the assignments, uh, it'll be a markdown file. So probably what you ought to do um, is download it and put it in your dev box and then open it up in your um, Visual Studio code editor so that you can render it uh, that way and, and see the feedback better. So. Um, or there is a PDF. So, so here, you know, again, these files are shared between your host system and um, uh, your dev box, your guest system. So you should be able to go to your browser um, and go to that location on your host system. Um, so our CS, CSCA 430 OS Sims, go to the particular assignment and, and find the, the PDF there. Um, because um, I think I mentioned it last time, uh, there doesn't seem to be a good um, viewer in Visual Studio Code for PDF files. I haven't been able to find one. So, so you have to rely on like a PDF viewer, um, like on Windows or on your host system. So, but you can open up the assignment description um, on your host system as well from the PDF there. So, um, So yeah, task one was initialized memory. That's what we mostly talked about last time. Um, so the purpose of translate address is, um, so we're gonna talk about memory uh, management in this class, that's our fourth unit. Um, and we'll, we'll run across this idea for um, managing memory that we're going to uh, have this idea of a virtual address space so, so the, the machine, the actual RAM, the actual physical memory will be the, the physical memory of the system, but each process will, will keep its own virtual address space, right? Um, and, but but um, in terms of this assignment, we, we do a similar thing. So our, when we're simulating a hypothetical machine, um, as I kind of showed last time, um, So if we bring up one of these sim files that we're simulating, um, we specify some block of memory that the simulation is using, uh, where the you know that that holds the instructions, and also you know this this program .sim file also has the initial values of the registers and the program counters and things like that. So, but but in particular, so for this simulation, we're on our hypothetical machine only has a memory. Uh, from 300 to 1,000, so a base address of 300 to um, a, what's known as a bounds address of 1,000. So that's kind of like the virtual address space. Um, and we have to translate that into, um, oops, into um, our simulations uh, address space. So, um, so let's find translate address. So this is the second function that you have to write. Um, here, if I didn't show up before, I, 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 I really like the outline instead of trying to scroll through or search through and find stuff. But um, so, you know, we did an initialized memory last time. We want to implement the translate address for um, the uh, task two for this assignment. 
So again, there, there's quite a few functions, member functions for our hypothetical machine here. Um, so instead of scrolling through, we can kind of find the translate address and find it here. So this is relatively simple. So basically when we're running the simulation, the, the addresses are gonna be kept track of or refer to that, that simulated address space. So 300 to 1,000 um, in our example here. Um, but for our hypothetical machine, we simulate memory by using this array um, called um, memory. So we talked about that last time and we showed initializing that um, um, uh, dynamically allocating that array last time in the um, initialized memory. So for example, you know, uh, memory, once, once you initialize memory, you know, we know that, that for example, for a simulation, the base address is 300, the bounds address is 1,000. That means that in our simulation, we've got 700, the difference between those um, addresses that we can use approximately. Right. So we actually initialize an array of integers to hold um, all those values of our simulated memory. But this array um, is a, a plain array, a plain C array. So, you know, it starts at index zero. Um, and, and since it has a memory size of 700 in this example, it has valid indexes from zero to 699. Right. So that's that's our array. So so anyway, so whenever we refer to a virtual address like 300 uh, in our simulation space, we need to translate that into a valid array index for the memory array of integers that we're using to simulate um, our hypothetical machine's memory here. Right? Well, that's the whole purpose of the translate address, right? So. How do you do that? I mean, a lot of these methods are really pretty simple. So if, if, if you find yourself writing 10 lines of code or something, you're probably overcomplicating things. I mean, a majority of these methods can be implemented uh, after initial, initialized memory was about the biggest one, I think. Uh, the rest of these, you know, two lines of code, three lines of code, maybe a single line of code will implement a lot of these for the rest of the tasks. So, uh, although the, the, the actual work is, is often one line, but then uh, sometimes there's some, uh, you also have to do some defensive programming. So um, that's true for the, for the translate address. So um, um, the basics for translate address is, we, we've got, for example, the, um, the base address of the simulation, right? So if I say that I want to translate a, simulated address 300, and I know the, the base address is 300, and I, I need to actually go to index zero of my memory array. So, so that's the translation from the simulated address to my actual memory array. So that, I mean, you know, basically you have to subtract that base address to get the actual index, right? If, if I want to do something for simulated address 500 and my, my base address is, is 300, that means that it's gonna be at index 200. Of, of the, the memory, of, of the actual physical memory um, that our hypothetical machine is using here, right? So that, that's really all that translate address is doing. So, so you need to do that translation and return the, the, the translate address. So that ends up being the, a valid index into the memory array uh, for our hypothetical machine, right? Besides that, though, you should you should check this this address. So, um, if if my bounds if my base address is three hundred and I ask to translate address two hundred ninety nine, um, you know we said um, we said that that our memory goes from three hundred to a thousand. So it's it's an error to have a memory address less than three hundred, right? So we're asking for defensive programming in this case that you know if, if this address is below the base address and and don't hard code these so these simulations can work you know with, with different things so like if i run the the second or let's, let's pick a different one so let's if i run program five simulation its memory is from 600 to 800 
right? So, you know, it, it's, you won't be able to pass all the tests if you hard code it to be 300, like I'm talking about here, as if it's always a base address of 300 to a bounds address of 1,000. So you have to be using what the current base address is uh, for whatever simulation is being run, right? So, um, so anyway, um, yeah, I mean, within translate address, besides the basic step of translating from the simulated to the real index or, or the real physical address, um, if it's below the bounds for the current simulation that we're running, or if it's, if it's, above, if it's below the, the base address, or if it's above the bounds address, uh, you should instead throw um, an exception. Um, and um, so, so this stuff is being tested. So, so most of the, the stuff for the first unit test is going to be testing task one. Uh, and then the, the next unit test, um, all these things in here are, are, are uh, testing task, task two stuff. So translate address. So in particular, um, if you're gonna go down here at the end is where we check that you're throwing the um, exceptions, um, or, or well, right here. So for example, again, if um, we initialize memory to have a base of 300 and a bounds of 1,000, if you send 299 to translate address, we should, we're ex instead ex expecting a uh, exception to be thrown, right? Um, and um, so here, this is saying that, that if you say that we go from 300 to 1,000, that the actual valid highest address is 999. So, um, um, so, so yeah, you should be checking um, if it's like bounds address minus one. Um, so, so if you're, or if it's equal to or greater than the bounds address. That should be an exception here. So again, I, I mentioned that last time. That's that's kind of because of our. Um, I don't know if I still have um, the file open here. I guess. It, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, that's kind of because of of our um, sixteen bit hypothetical machine. So sixteen bits comes out to three hex digits um, if you're looking at them as as digits. So, so in, in reality, I mean, the, the actual limit would be from hex 000 to hex um, FFF, right? So that's not exactly a zero to 1000. Um, so, so we're not, we're really only supporting decimal um, in our um, uh, implementation, which is a little bit of incorrect here, you know? So if, if we were to go back and fix, I, I could leave that as like extra credit or as a, exercise for interested students. So, so we, you know, we could add into our machine, hypothetical machine simulator that we support true hexadecimal representations of addresses and values and things here, right? But, but we're mostly kind of just using decimal, which is why we kind of limit it to be from 000 to 999 uh, for the address portion uh, in here. So. Um, All right. So yeah, it's already getting past eleven forty here. Let's um, let's look at the um, um, rest of the tasks here. Let's make certain that we touch base on them. Where's my PDF here? So that was that was translate address. Um, task three is to implement peak and poke address. So these are really just. Um, um, methods that the simulation can do to read and write values in and out of the simulated memory, okay? So, um, so that should be being tested in the third test case here. Um, oh, actually, no, I'm wrong. So the third test case uh, does some general things of loading stuff. So I think peek and poke, um, if you look down here, um, Well, anyway, so there it is. So, so, um, so it is the third test case. So, so here's where we're testing kind of the peak and the poke address kind of stuff. So, um, 
Oh yeah. So the, basically the reason why we do this is so like if we load the program one SIM using load program, you don't have to write load program. That's one that's already implemented for you. But if we load that in um, and you've got your um, um, initialized memory working correctly, um, it, it'll load the, the file from program zero one SIM in, you know, which again is um, this one. So for example, if we load this program in, we're expecting 1940 to be in memory address 300 after we load that program, right? Um, so, I mean, that's where we're, we're testing all of your implementations of peak address. So if we, if we load program one and we peak at address 300, it should have 1940. And 301 should have 5941, right? Um, and memory address 940, Could have a value of three. Uh, in there, right? That's all this tests are doing, right? So, what do you have to do for for peak address? Um, you have to return. You know, so, so, it takes as an input a simulated address, and it returns the value. So, it has to look it up in the actual physical memory array, right? So, so I believe this is you know discussed in the assignment descriptions. So you should be reusing the translate address here. So, so you're given a simulated address, you're going to call translate address to translate it into an actual index into the memory array, then you're going to access that value and return it. Um, so that's what peak address does, is it re re reads the value. So, and by the way, I mean, this is basically what load does. So when you implement the load instruction, basically all you have to do is call peak address. Um, for the load instructions for our hypothetical machine. Right. Um, and then I guess the next unit test, we, we um, probably test doing some pokes. Oh, we did. All right, I guess that, that um, um, the load program is probably using the, the poke. So, so these tests won't work unless you also have poke address working. You know, let me see if we, uh, oh no, so, so we do have some, we're, we're explicitly poking some addresses in here as well, so. Um, I must have scrolled past this one. So, so here's, the, this, this happens before we get down here and try to load a program. So, so yeah, I mean, if you initialize kind of an empty memory and, and if we arbitrarily poke like a 42 to address 300, um, and then if we peek it back out, we should get 42 back out and you know, so on. So, so poke address is the right or the store basically uh, of, of our hypothetical machine here. So for poke address, you take a simulated address for the first parameter and a value. Um, and again, you should be using reusing translate address to do this one, um, but that should um, um, write this value into the physical memory array of the simulation. Get your values in. So that's that's what poke address is doing. Um, yeah, and then for like four, five, and six um, um, basically are implementing the fetch execute cycle and then the particular instructions. The um, uh, so we didn't do like all the instructions that you did for the problem set. Um, I, I, well, I mean, there wasn't that, so there's a jump in there, but I don't think we have any conditional jumps, um, but, but a few of them. So, so the basic ones, load, store, add, subtract, um, and a, a unconditional jump um, are the only ones in this assignment here. So, um, so, so the fetch should be doing the fetch stage, Right. So for fetch, um, you're going to basically be using the current value of the program counter. So remember, the program counter um, is set when you like load a program. So basically, you're going to be reading the value um, out of out of memory that that the program counter is is pointing to the program counter should have a you know a simulated address so you'll want to translate that address um, and read the value out and then um 
or, or well, I, I guess you don't have to translate address, so you, you can just directly call peak address because peak address should be doing the translation for you. So you can peak address to the simulated value, whatever the PC is pointing to. Um, and then you, you just need to put that into the instruction register, right? So um, if it's not clear, um, so besides like the memory array and the memory base address and the bounds address and the memory size. So now for these fetch and execute things, you're gonna be using some of these other member variables. So you have to use the program counter, the accumulator, the instruction register um, and, and, and these other things. So, um, so in particular, what I just described is you need to peek out of whatever value the program counter is looking at to do the fetch and then save that into the instruction register. So that's, that's what the fetch is. Um, taking the next value, whatever it's pointed to by the program counter and, and transferring it into the instruction register um, for our machine architecture here, right? Um, And then the execute is a little bit more complicated. So for the execute, you have to simulate doing a decode of the instruction. Um, and then once you've decoded, um, you're just gonna write a big switch statement or a big if else statement. So, so you know, if you decode the 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 instruction and if it's an if it's a load instruction, then you're going to have to call it the execute load method. And, and if you decode it into store instruction, you execute the store instruction, right? Again, remember these instructions, the, the decode part um, is, um, uh, oh, I mean, you, know, you have to increment the PC by one for the execute um, and, and a few other things, but, but to, to translate or decode the instruction, um, basically, you know, we're, we're using, we're, we're assuming that all those values um, have, uh, have four digits, right? And, and we are using decimal instead of hexadecimal. So, so, so for the simulation, you should think of those as, as these as decimal now. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the first digit um, is the instruction opcode, right? So to get that, uh, you know, you want to use uh, division and modulus, right? So if you do a modulus um, by a thousand, you'll get the remainder. So that would give you the the address part. And if you do an integer division by a thousand, um, you'll get the first digit, right? So, so by using integer division and modulus division or, or remainder, uh, you can extract out this first digit of the four to get the instruction opcode. Um, um, and that should end up being put into the um, instruction opcode here, right? Um, and then the, 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 the three digits, um, the other three parts go into the instru instruction address, right? So that's part of the translate for the execute. You just need to break those apart into the opcode and the address. And then once you have those, um, once you've decoded those, then basically, you know, you're going to do a, a, a if else statement or a switch statement of some kind on the opcode. You know, and if it's an opcode one, call execute. Um, load and if it's opcode two, call execute store and so on. Right. Um, and then, yeah, just to wrap up here. So, I mean, I that all of these these um, uh, executions. Then, I mean, if you gotten this far, hopefully they'll be relatively simple. Again, these are probably all like one-liners. Um, so like I already mentioned, like load and store are pretty much like just calling peek and poke correctly um, for those, right? Jump, um, you basically need to, uh, it's, it's an absolute jump in this case. And we're not doing any conditional jump. So whatever the address, so, so you, you decoded the address portion of the current instruction. So if you're executing a jump, you just need to take the address portion of the instruction and change the PC to be that address to do the jump, right? Um, and then add and subtract are a little bit more complicated. So you have to um, um, take the value out of the address because you you're gonna be like, for example, adding, adding 
the contents, the current contents of the accumulator with the contents of memory that's that was decoded from the address portion of the instruction. So you need to peek the value out of memory, add those together, put those back into the um, accumulator, right? Or subtract, um, subtract those if you're doing a subtract correctly. Um, and then so I, I, I don't think for task seven you really have to do anything except for uncomment something okay so those are basically the run simulation mostly there for you um, okay, I'm a little bit longer than I wanted to on that. Let, let me say one more thing, uh, and then I'm going to stop and see if there's some more questions here locally. Um, I don't think anybody's been asking questions yet who's remote here. Um, so I did want to go back to, um, let me close this off. I'll talk more about this on Thursday as well. So, so the ultimate um, goal of, of these assignments is to build the full simulation. Um, so, I don't know why I'm not. Oh, no, oh, how I got there. I don't know what I did there. Um, so let's, um, I've got a working solution here so I can kind of show you. Um, so if you have everything, all seven of those tasks completed, um, um, if you, you know, so your ultimate goal um, as you're developing or writing the, the code for the simulation is, of course, it needs to compile. And when you run the test, uh, you should see that all the tests are passing, right? And, and, and at this point, once those are all passing, your simulation should be working. So um, 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 you can actually run um, the simulations from the command line. You do have to run them from the command line. So. Um, if you open up a new terminal in your assignment, uh, so for example, the, the, these all build a program that's meant to be run from the command line. So these are building command line tools or, or command line um, programs here. So in this case, uh, the, the simulations, if you want to run the simulations by hand, uh, they'll always take some parameters. Like for example, in this case, um, in order to avoid like infinite loops, our simulation, we, we specify the maximum number of fetch execute cycles to simulate. Um, and um, if it reaches that, it just is supposed to halt instead of continue running. All right. But it, but then in particular, we specify a sim file, one of those sim files. So, so again, all the, the simulation files are in uh, the sim file subdirectory. The, the program one.sim um, is the example from our textbook, right? So this, this should be the same example from our textbook. So, so if I want to load the program one sim um, and run it, um, we can do that, right? So the result will be, um, you know, so initially, so, so what you get on output is uh, we see the fetch execute the first fetch execute cycle, the second one, third one, and the fourth one. In this case, um, 
once we got to the fourth one, the program counter was 303. So for the next cycle, uh, uh, there was no value in 303. So it treats um, a zero as a halt instruction um, and, and it stops at that point, right? Um, So what you see, so initially memory um, um, was like this. Uh, again, this is the, the example from our textbook. So with the program counter of 300, uh, it starts by fetching the, the 1940 at address 300 into the instruction register. And then for the execute stage, so, so this is what I was talking about for the execute. So after the execute, uh, we extracted um, the one digit out, and that's the opcode. And we extracted the 940 out, that was the address portion. The program counter got incremented by one, um, and that's a load instruction uh, in this case, right? Uh, and then after we, you know, so, so this is showing the, the result after doing the execute. So this should have caused the value at 940, which was a two, um, to um, end up being transferred transfer into the accumulator. Um, sorry, at, at 940. Is there a bug there? Yeah, three. So yeah, so, so the value at 940 versus a three um, to get uh, loaded into the accumulator and so on. Um, um, if you run the make test target, it should run the system test, although I had a problem there for some reason. I'll have to check that for people. Um, So yeah, if, if you run tests by hand and if all the unit tests are passing, it should also run a system test. So it actually runs um, all these, these program.sim files uh, and checks that it's getting the expected result on all those. So what you wanna see, uh, assuming that that run system test is working is if you run your tests, all your unit tests pass um, and ultimately at the end, then you get all these system tests pass here. Um, I think that should run if you do, yeah, so I, I think if you do like a, a make, if you do a control shift three, it only runs the unit tests um, uh, when you're using the keyboard shortcut. So, so if you want to run the system tests as well, um, I guess you have to, to run them by hand in the formal, or, or you can also do a run system tests. Uh, I'll talk more about those on Thursday. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here, see if um, people want to ask any questions. Uh, but yeah, I mean that that's most all of the um, um, that, that was all the task for the assignment. Somebody's asking a question about um, uh, about the, the translating the address to hexadecimal format when we execute the sub. So at, at this point, um, uh, you can just interpret all of those addresses in the simulation as decimal. So, so don't worry about uh, doing hexadecimal translation, uh, things like that. So that makes it easy uh, if, if it's decimal that you can just do a division by a thousand and a mod by a thousand to extract the opcode and the memory portion when you're decoding the um, uh, instruction for the, uh, for the execute phase, all right? Other questions? All right. Um, so yeah, I mean, as usual, email questions if you have them. Keep working on the assignment. I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the share here. I'll post this as usual as well in our class playlist. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys later then. So and I'll stick around for people that are local here if they have if they want to keep working on issues and things. So. Um,